we're going to start talking about greenhouses. We're going to start with glass first. And with, when we talk about glass, we're going to talk about the basic structures and frames. Until about the 1950s, um, glass was the only kind of greenhouse uh, structure we had. And when you compare glass to uh, plastic panels, polyethylene sheeting, or something like that, glass has always got the greatest light transmission. Uh, glass also is not the tightest, therefore it's going to have more leaks. And when you have more leaks, you have more air exchange. With more exchange, you have a, a drier greenhouse climate. And you also have greater evapotranspiration, uh, which means the plants are going to grow a little faster. And with the lower relative humidity, you're going to have le a, less, a lower incident of disease. So there, there are some sideline benefits to having a glass greenhouse, even though it's the most expensive. Now, that leaky greenhouse is also a disadvantage because it's going to require more heat. Uh, it's also going to require a higher initial cost of construction. The higher initial cost of construction means because it's, it's a heavier weight, it's going to require more framing. Um, but the maintenance over the long term is going to be less. And because the plastics require a regular recovering, even the polycarbonates, we're going to recover those every 15 years or so anyway. Glass greenhouses are basically considered to be permanent. So we talk about glass greenhouse structures, or greenhouse structures at all, give you a, a little overview of the basics. And the first greenhouse design I'm going to talk about is what we call the lean-to. And a lean-to is a greenhouse is just placed against an existing wall. And the existing wall, of course, is usually facing south, or if you're in the southern hemisphere, facing north. So you get the most maximum amount of solar energy into the greenhouse. This is a real common greenhouse for schools, hobby greenhouses, institutional greenhouses, like uh, universities and research centers. And it's a great, good and easy way to to build a greenhouse. This is a, a lean-to greenhouse at Montana State University. This is uh, facing south. Their plant growth center is here, and it's, uh, that's how their greenhouses are built. And it takes advantage <coughs> of that, that uh, winter, winter sun. Um, and we're not exposing the north side. We're actually putting it up against the building, so we're not having a heat loss from that side of the building and actually incorporating it into the building. This is a um, lean-to greenhouse uh, that was built, uh, this is outside of Paonia, Colorado, where they've got their glass panels on the, on, the, uh, on the main side to get that heavy, or that uh, get that summer, get the winter light into the greenhouse. And then they've got fiberglass on top, which is older and doesn't have the good light transmission. And it's providing a little shade during the summer months in that greenhouse. And so they're capitalizing on both seasons with, with that particular structure. Some people with hobby lean-to greenhouses will uh, use a, an opaque material that doesn't even let any light in at all. After the lean-to structure, we have what's called an even span. And even span greenhouses are the most common. And um, there we have two slopes on either side of equal pitch and width. The typical is um, 6 by 12, 6 foot rise, 12 foot, uh, 12 foot run. And uh, this is the most common configuration of greenhouses in the United States. Uneven span. Can you imagine what an un uneven span greenhouse would be used for? On a hillside. Exactly. Could be used on a hillside. So uh, hillsides are difficult to navigate because it's hard to move things around. But you could build an uneven span. It's adaptable to slopes. This is really uh, ideal greenhouse design for high latitudes. Uh, you will see uneven spans a lot in northern Canada, where the wide, sup the wide side is facing to the south and the short side is facing to the north. Some people might even put transparent glazing on the wide side and opaque glazing on the narrow side. So it just depends on how you're designing your greenhouse. So it's adaptable to slopes, and you can use it for energy conservation or some other uh, creative um, type of um, designs. 
you could also maybe build it into the hillside and have an additional um, area underneath beneath grade and give yourself a little bit more uh, insulation value. Most greenhouses, uh, especially in the United States where they're trying to get larger production areas, is we use what's called a gutter connect. You'll see words like gutter connect, ridge and furrow, um, greenhouse designs, and the idea behind this design is to eliminate internal walls. By eliminating the internal walls, we have a wider space inside the greenhouse so it's easier to maneuver with equipment, benches, crops, etc. But also by having the wall the, the greenhouses no internal all there are no walls separating, we reduce the surface area of the greenhouse exposed to the environment. So there's more they're cheaper to heat. Because if we separated all these greenhouses, that would add two, four, six additional walls that are going to lose heat. So that's the primary advantage is they save energy. The secondary advantage is it opens up the whole space in between uh, if you take the walls down. Another design, a modification of the Gutter Connect is called the Gutter Connect Barrel Vault. And we call this a barrel vault because it looks like half a barrel. And uh, what's a, the, advan the advantage of the barrel vault, the barrel vault design, is these, these are easy to use for polyethylene film or for other types of structures. And sometimes they're a little cheaper to build in certain parts of the country than the, the, the traditional even span. Are there any benefits of separating the greenhouses? Are there any benefits of separating the greenhouses? That's a good question. Uh, the benefits to separating a greenhouse would be to have separate climates. Uh, benefit would be to um, have um, separation for insect and disease control. For instance, if you had a greenhouse where you were growing stock plants for propagation and you wanted to maintain those greenhouse, that greenhouse is disease and insect free, use a different kind of uh, pest control strategy to keep the viruses out or something, you would separate those. One of the issues with the gutter connect is snow accumulation in between. Okay? Uh, snow accumulation is, is, is definitely a problem. What the greenhouse designers will do to solve that problem is they'll put heating pipes underneath the uh, gutters. And by putting a heating pipe underneath the gutter, when they have snow accumulation, it just obviously melts the snow. Um, <coughs> But that is an issue, um, and uh, it uh, can be a problem, so forth. Question? Uh, well, maybe you're going to answer my question <coughs> in the next slide, but is there a different uh, structural value between the um, gutter connect and the barrel hole in the sense of like wind shear <coughs> and, and wind, high wind velocity passing over it? And things like that, because if you're using plastics and stuff, I always hear about plastics being blown off. Well, the, the, they're all going to have turbulence created, and there's probably less turbulence on a barrel vault than there is on the, uh, uh, the traditional, okay, even the traditional even span. Um, it just, one of the, one of the, some, you might consider tilting your greenhouse a little bit off angle if you have a high wind area to make sure that it, it is more efficient. But um, there are some issues with wind. Probably one of the more common uh, greenhouse designs is called the Quonset. Quonset um, or Quonset hut is based, we also hear them called a hoop house. Um, if they're not heated, they're also called high tunnels. And I did a little research on, on the word Quonset at one point. And where did the word Quonset come from? And the word Quonset comes from Quonset, Rhode Island. And that's because they were built, uh, the early uh, structures were built uh, in a factory that was in Quonset, Rhode Island. And they were, they were on a contract um, 
during um, World War II where they were asked to build a shelter for the military that they could set up with unskilled labor because remember most of the people that were drafted during World War II uh, probably didn't have much more than a high school education if they had that and they didn't have a lot of um, uh, skills so they designed this, uh, this structure that could be erected quickly without a lot of skill and uh, was easy to move. Uh, it was based, some people think that this was based upon um, the old Iroquois lodges, but that, because it's kind of an Iroquois sounding name, but everything in Northeast sounds like an Iroquois sounding name. Um, but, um, and it's also probably closer aligned to something that they've uh, built in World War I. Now, a Quonset frame is really, really easy to build. For instance, um, I have erected a Quonset frame myself, by myself. It doesn't take a lot of labor. Uh, you can put them up really quickly. Um, easy to build and easy to cover. So um, they're inexpensive. <coughs> uh, you can put just about any covering on them that you want. Um, so forth. High tunnel or poly hut. You'll hear the word poly hut quite a lot. So when you're looking at a, a glass structure, uh, the old glass structures were made out of wood or wood out of or made out of uh, pipe. In the old greenhouses, the old pipe fr the wood frame greenhouse you basically couldn't build a greenhouse that was greater than 20 feet wide. When I started using pipes and posts, um, we were able to go up to 40 feet wide. So one of the things that this particular, in the traditional greenhouse design, we've got the post support, we have cross ties, and we have purlins. The purlins run the, the, width, the length of the greenhouse, the cross ties run the width. The purlins is the term we use that supports what's called a sash bar. And the sash bar is act what actually holds the glass. Okay? And purlins can be, uh, this is a, a diagram of a pipe frame, and the rafters run perpendicular to the ridge line, the purlins run parallel to the ridge, li ridge line, then the sash bars rest on top of the purlins. Now your greenhouse engineers, what they do is they calculate out the required snow load and that sort of thing for your greenhouse, the dead load if you're going to hang baskets from the roof or something like this, and that's how they determine the kind of rafter or truss you need, which I'll show you in a minute, or the number of purlins that you need. And that's why that's important. Modern greenhouses now are using steel, either square steel or angle steel or folded steel depending on the manufacturer. And the sash bars are no longer made out of wood, they're made out of aluminum. The old sash bars are all made out of cypress. The modern truss frame greenhouse eliminated the need for a support post in the middle of the greenhouse. What would be the advantage of removing a post in the middle of the greenhouse? Space, it adds space and is less to maneuver. So the modern truss frames are built to have open span. Most greenhouses built today use truss frames. And the truss frames are either made out of flat steel, tubular steel, or square steel. They're either hot dip galvanized or painted galvanized. <coughs> the differences between all of those is based upon the manufacturer. If you uh, go through the website, I've got links to a company called Nexus Corporation. Okay, Nexus Corporation, uh, there's a couple of reasons why I'm using that link in particular because a lot of the pictures that I have were donated by Nexus Corporation and they pay taxes in the state of Colorado because they're manufactured here in, in North Glen. So when you look at the different frame structures, the up, upper left hand corner, this is the traditional pipe frame we have side posts, columns in the middle, cross tie, which goes across, 
connects the post. We have the strut, and then we have knee braces. That's the old design. That was the uh, primary Lord and Burnham structure. The modern clear span that uses a, a, a truss, a manufactured truss, we have a bottom cord, then we have struts and cords that connect it. And depending upon the snow load or wind load, de depends on how the engineer designs the struts and cords. Frankly, most greenhouse manufacturers just have one truss frame design, and they add or subtract from the truss frame design with knee braces or wind braces or something like that to give it additional strength. These two drawings on the right hand side differentiate between the low profile house and a high profile house. In the United States, most of our greenhouses are built on a high profile. It's basically a six by 12 pitch and this is the traditional um, house frame and this particular greenhouse, uh, if you imagine a 100 foot long greenhouse with a 21 foot width, a rectangle 100 by 21, if you did your geometry and calculated out the square foot of this roof area, you would have 2,340 square feet. The low profile house, which is more common in Northern Europe, this is the more common design in Northern Europe, we call them a Venlo house for the Venlo region of, ne of the Netherlands, or you'll call it Dutch, or some people call it, these are actually greenhouses that are com more common for uh, greenhouse vegetables. Now the low profile greenhouse, 21 feet by 100 feet, the roof area is 2,200. So that's a difference of 140 square feet. When it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're paying that fuel bill, that is a lot because that's less surface area that's going to transmit energy. Makes sense? The other thing about this, this greenhouse, the volume under the eaves, because these are both 10 foot high in this, in this graphic, the volume, this has got 1,722 cubic feet of space eaves under the volume here oh the oh I'm sorry the B eaves above the above volume eaves is 1722 the volume here is 5515 so we have a lot more volume above the lower cord the bottom cord than we do up here can you imagine any significant differences there? Here we've got a lot more volume and this is going to give us a bigger cushion in our daily temperature change. Th this greenhouse is designed for northern latitudes. This greenhouse is designed for temperate latitudes. Top greenhouse, northern latitudes. The bottom greenhouse, temperate latitudes. The biggest, volume, biggest advantage of the Venlo, or the low profile house, is the volume that we have under the cord for what I call a three-dimensional crop. A three-dimensional crop is that crop that takes up more volume in the greenhouse. Think of bedding plants as a two-dimensional crop. It grows flat on a bench. I know it's a three-dimensional structure, but it's only going to grow about three, four inches. But if you're doing tomatoes or roses or something like that, where you need the entire volume of the greenhouse, that's what I mean by three-dimensional. And that's why this particular greenhouse, the Venlo design, is more common for vegetables. So how do we put the glass on the greenhouse? In the old days, we would take the sash bar, we'd scrape it, paint it, put a bead of putty down, lay the glass on. Most sash bars today are made out of aluminum because they're stronger. Aluminum is stronger than wood. And because it's stronger, it's lighter, requiring less superstructure to hold up the frame. And the aluminum is a little more reflective. Painted wood reflects pretty good if you repaint it every three to five years. And of course, it's a lot less um, labor to maintain. 
So the top graphic, this is the old traditional milled sash bar. And this is what was made out of cypress. And you can see the cross section where we have a trough for us to lay the bead of putty. And we'd lay the glass into the bead of putty, put a bead of putty on top of that, and lay what's on top of what's called a bar cap. And what that bar cap does is it spreads out the water across that and doesn't let it soak in, and it holds the glass in place. The little notch that we see on the bottom channel, that's actually a condensate channel. And what it does is, as <coughs> water condenses on the glass, it'll, tr it'll track over to the edge and wick over to the edge, hit the wooden sash bar, drop down, and it ca catches in that little channel, which takes the condensate to the edge of the greenhouse and not allow it to drip onto your plants. Because that condensate is cold and it's going to, if you're growing a crop where the leaves are sensitive to cold water, it's going to give us leaf spots. The modern aluminum sash bar, which is in the bottom, what we use now is rather than putty is we use neoprene, neoprene seals, and we still have a bar cap that's got uh, a, uh, a little sealer in there as well. And we, these are extruded aluminum, and we, have, we still have that little um, condensate capturing channel. And they'll also sometimes put little channels for sliding a screw in or something like that to hang something from <coughs> that uh, particular condensate channel. One thing as a grower you need to remember is when the maintenance people come in and they start hanging lights from your equipment, that they can't drill into that condensate channel. They can't weld into that condensate channel. They can't clip something into that condensate channel because what will happen is whatever they do to disrupt that condensate channel will cause a drip in your greenhouse. So s you need to smack them around. Old greenhouses, we used a 16-inch pane of glass, 16 inches. Okay, that was the traditional glass. Uh, up to 39 inch panes of glass, uh, 39 inches, those are typically tempered glass, plate glass. Um, the more width you can get on your panes of glass, the less framing you have. When we reduce the framing, we're reducing shadows. So wider panes give us more light. Old glass, uh, the traditional glass is what's called float glass. They take the uh, glass that's in its liquid form, and they float it on a, on a film of water. And that's how they make glass. If you look through our windows here, our wonderful windows with the uh, tinted uh, sun film on them, you can see inconsistencies in the glass. That's basically inconsistencies in how they were floated. Traditional float glass has about 88% light transmission. Low iron glass, glass that's manufactured for greenhouses, where they've reduced the amount of iron using uh, higher quality materials, is 90 to 92 percent light transmission, but of course it's more expensive. So here's some pictures of some modern, gla modern glass greenhouses, and that's a 39 inch width. 39 inches, that's an interesting number. <coughs> what is 39 inches? One meter, exactly, good. So here you can see um, the glass frames <coughs> running uh, parallel to the ridge line. We have our purlins. Wherever you see this black strip, that's a sash bar uh, with a bar cap. This particular one is using a rubber bar cap on top. Tempered glass. 6 by 13. These are huge sheets of glass. And tempered glass can actually be bent to a curve. It's flexible. Glass is actually a supercooled liquid. You can bend it to a curve. By going to a wider structure with tempered glass, you have fewer sea seals, fewer eaves, and less structure. Tempered glass. Tempered glass can be pretty strong. Um, I'm not one to walk on a glass roof. but uh, And one another thing with the gutters, you want to make sure that the gutters that you're in your 
manufacturer is using it makes the gutters wide enough for a shoe. You don't want to walk through there. You want to be able to walk and have a sturdy, sturdy system. And here's a tempered glass curved roof. And uh, I see this greenhouse. This is a, a cucumber greenhouse in Ontario. So. We've already talked about the low profile. Here's a, a Venlo house. Most of the Venlo houses, the vents are not continuous, but separated, lower pitch angle, less heating cost, <coughs> high profile, large roof area, greater heating cost. Hail is always a risk with glass. Tempered glass can withstand a hailstone up to about the size of a softball. But every, even every tempered glass greenhouse is going to have some panes of glass that are traditional glass because tempered glass cannot be cut on site. It has to be cut with a machine. Whereas regular glass you can cut with a scoring knife. So this is a greenhouse that's just uh, experienced a major hailstorm. And uh, when you start insuring a piece of property, uh, when you start looking at building a greenhouse, you need to look at your insurance rates on whether you want to use glass or something else. And this is what a greenhouse looks like after a hailstorm on the inside. Snow damage. This is a greenhouse that was crushed by snow. Uh, it was not, um, the, the superstructure wasn't built to code and snow damage can be a problem. Um, I've seen snow damage in uh, Colorado and greenhouses, the greenhouses we thought were built but it needs to be taken into concept. Sometimes what will happen if we'll see snow damage like this if their heating system is not turned on under the gutters and we get the snow load under the gutter of the greenhouse. And that's what pulls it down. Okay. So that's a brief overview of glass greenhouse structures. The next thing I want to talk about are film plastic greenhouses. And film plastic greenhouses um, are probably we see them more often than not, more often than others, because they're inexpensive to build. And this particular structure is, 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 is a film plastic greenhouse. It's, uh, this particular example is, is actually being used for storage, but uh, it works very well in other different kinds of uh, situations. Your textbook discusses uh, these five types of fil plastic films, polyethylene, vinyl film, polyvinyl fluoride, polyester, and a commercial product called Tefsil. Polyethylene is by and far the most common greenhouse film that's used in the United States. The greenhouse film that we're using, it's a six mil. Six mil refers to the thickness. Uh, some people will use two different thicknesses, like a six mil on the outside or a four mil on the inside. Uh, you can do that to save money, but frankly, most people use six mil on the inside as well. Typically, we use a double layer for that insulation value, like a big down parka. And the polyethylene film that we're using in greenhouses <coughs> is manufactured specifically for greenhouses in that in the chemistry of the manufacturing process, they include ultraviolet inhibitors, use UV inhibitors to extend the shelf life. Most polyethylene films are specifically uh, guaranteed to last three to five years under most conditions. However, in Colorado, we typically, a film doesn't survive that long because it either gets tore up by wind or the high light. Some films are manufactured with anti-fogging materials. In other words, they shed the water on the inside to prevent condensation. Or we can use infrared energy blockers. So probably one of the more significant adaptations of polyethylene films in the last 20 years has been the inclusion of infrared blockers. Typical polyethylene film, when the sunlight comes in, it, uh, we get the light penetration and it reflects and scatters and we grow our crops. Standard, elect standard films, though, have a tendency to um, re-radiate energy from inside. In other words, that infrared energy 
that the light that comes in as uh, shortwave radiation from the sun is absorbed by the structures and re-radiated back as infrared energy and it's lost. In other words, it goes right through that film. What the infrared blockers do is that they take that shortwave energy that comes into the greenhouse, it's converted to infrared long, radi long wave radiation and it blocks it and keeps that inside the greenhouse. So the added value to this is that we're taking advantage of that energy that's coming in from the sun to maintain some of that heat. And the infrared films do cost more money. So what most people will do is they'll use an infrared film on the inside and a standard film on the outside so it doesn't quite cost as much money for you. So these films block that re-radiation and also they uh, give us an ad advantage of more diffuse light. Polyvinyl fluoride, question. Is there an advantage to using the film on both layers? Is there an advantage to using the film on both layers? It's just more infrared blocking. Um, uh, and it's, it's easier to keep up with where you've when you've covered the film. Most people will put on both sheets of film at the same time and it's just, it's easier. Other question? Is, that is this plastic recyclable? Uh, polyethylene film is recyclable. Uh, one of the big issues that most people have with handling polyethylene film when they're pulling it off a greenhouse is the disposal of a large volume of plastic and there's considerable amount of, uh, when you think about the tipping fee, what I'm referring to is how much it costs to put it in the landfill, it's pretty significant. The standard polyethylene recycling organizations do not accept greenhouse film because it's dirty. It's been out in an environment for three to five years and it's really hard to, t hard to deal with. And uh, so, uh, in regions where we have lots of poly greenhouses, there are companies that are set up to handle and transport and deliver the polyethylene film to recycle it. Uh, the other challenge is getting it into a form that you can handle. Um, and I've never seen it done, but it's my understanding that you can feed this through a baler and it will bale, like a bale of hay. But I wouldn't want to use my baler doing that. I mean. And this is just something I've been told, but I've never seen it done, so. But the polyethylene film is recyclable, but for instance, in Colorado, the, the delivery cost to get it to a, a company that will recycle it uh, exceeds the value in fuel cost to ship it. But in certain parts of the country, it is recyclable. When you say certain parts of the country, is it more on the west? Coast? More on the eastern coast. And I probably on the west coast, southwest coast as well. But uh, I just know that it's a question that our growers have asked several times, and we've never been able to come up with a recycling program. We do have one for polystyrene flats, but not for polyethylene film that I know of yet. <coughs> so that's a good question for Dan Gerace when we visit that greenhouse. Okay, left to right, this is a standard, standard film. Energy's coming in. Next stage is the energy, the infrared radiation is radiating out. The infrared blocking films in the third picture is keeping that infrared radiation in the greenhouse. That keeps it warmer, yes. And this fourth and final picture is just showing that polyethylene film diffuses light. Okay, you're referring to um, tinted films. And actually, I wasn't going to talk about tinted films until later in the semester, where they've gone and put a tint where they've changed the wavelength. They're adjusting the uh, wavelength of the light and growing shorter, more compact plants. And that's a new technology that's being developed that we were going to talk about later in the semester. Okay. Polyvinyl fluoride. Polyvinyl chloride films, PVC, 
Uh, they're 8 to 12. They have a 4 to 5 year life. Uh, these are common in Japan and in Asia. The, uh, they have a longer life than polyethylene. They're more expensive. However, they have a high static charge. And what might a high static charge, what kind of problem might that give us on a greenhouse structure? It retracts and holds dust, exactly. It retracts and holds dust. Um, one of the things that builds a cornice with snow is a static charge. As the snow tumbles across the snowpack, it gathers that static charge, and that's what holds snow together to form cornices that eventually break and cause avalanches. The same thing happens when dust and debris is blown across the surface of a greenhouse <coughs> film, specifically PVC, is it creates an electrical charge and it holds onto that dirt. <coughs> so that's one of the reasons, it's one of the primary reasons it's not commonly used in the United States. Polyvinyl fluoride, this is uh, another commercial brand, it's called Tedlar. Actually, Tedlar over the years is commonly used as a co coating for fiberglass reinforced plastic. And um, the Tedlar sheets are uh, very expensive, 10 times more expensive than polyethylene. High light transmission, long life, but it's uh, a little expensive. Polyester, uh, one of the common names is mylar. We typically see this being used not so much as a greenhouse glazing, but as a base or a fabric for greenhouse shade cloth. And what they'll do is they'll incorporate little s strips of aluminum to give it a shade value and it's used primarily as a shade material. We also use uh, polyester films in what's called a retractable roof greenhouse. And I'll show you some pictures of a retractable roof greenhouse where this greenhouse actually opens and closes by opening and closing the, the film to open it up to the environment. So it's pretty common for that. Tefsel. 20-year um, product, ethylene tetrafluoroethylene, 95% uh, transmission. It's a 50-inch wide. That's how wide they're manufactured. So they're hard to use for stretching over a greenhouse roof. By and far, in the United States, most film greenhouses are polyethylene. Some tricks about polyethylene is polyethylene has a significant shrinking and expansion in temperature. If you put your greenhouse on when it's 100 degrees out and you pull it tight because you think it should be tight, when it goes to five degrees below zero, it'll shrink up about six inches and it'll rip itself off the greenhouse. So learning how much slack and stuff to give a polyethylene is a challenge. Most polyethylene greenhouses are um, a uh, hoop type structure or a barrel vault. Uh, a frames are, are sometimes <coughs> used. They're hard to attach because they have to be attached on the top and the bottom uh, requires a little bit more uh, covering technology. Most people use a frame type, um, quonsets, bent bows, um, 20 to 30 feet wide. Uh, you can either use uh, for polyethylene film what we call ground to ground, which means the polyethylene film goes all the way from the ground to, the, or you can use a raised sidewall with, with a uh, rigid plastic or something like that. But this is by and far the most common greenhouse that you'll see. Barrel vaults, gutter connected, sidewalls, uh, eight to fourteen feet. This is very common, um, easy to cover. Um, you've, uh, there are some technologies, this is a caves greenhouse design out of South Louisiana where they have the whole section allows some venting. <coughs> sawtooth greenhouse design, uh, sawtooth greenhouse design is very common in um, maritime climates, for instance the west coast. And the idea behind the sawtooth venting uh, works very well with the polyethylene film where we have openings. Is that opening leeward or windward? Leeward. The opening is leeward. 
So as the wind blows across the sawtooth, it draws the air through the side walls and out through the greenhouse. Very efficient greenhouse design, primarily a maritime design. We see these greenhouses a lot in uh, Florida, a lot in Southern California, not so much in the interior of the country. Why are they only seen in maritime climates? Well, one of the one of the things about a maritime climate is that we have consistent winds. Con the winds are consistent. The winds in Colorado are usually consistent to the west, but we also get a lot of strong winds out of the southeast, especially in the springtime. Those southeastern winds would rip this greenhouse apart. So you have to think about your wind when you're looking at your greenhouse design. Polyethylene film, polyethylene film greenhouses are typically done as a double layer. And the challenge is to lock that double layer onto the roof. In the old days, we used to take and roll the greenhouse up with a, with a little uh, strip of lath and then ha uh, roll it over that a couple of times and pound a nail into the frame to hold the, the polyethylene film on. Still a lot of people do that. It's pretty fast, it's pretty cheap, but most uh, Greenhouses are now constructed with a, clamp, a clamping channel. And a clamping channel basi basically just snaps the poly into place. And the great thing about a clamping channel is that if you get it too tight, you need to loosen it, you can come back in, release it, and put it back together fairly quickly. A um, 100-foot strip of a clamping channel can be snapped into place by one, one worker probably in about five minutes with a rubber mallet. There are lots of different kinds of, of poly locks, uh, some with plastic inserts, some with uh, snap faces, just depends on the manufacturer. Reinforced polyethylene is common uh, in more industrial type structures. Uh, you can see that it's, it's pretty strong. I don't, uh, probably most polyethylene uh, films the greenhouse structure will break before the film breaks if it's put on correctly with snow load or something like that. Um, this reinforced polyethylene actually isn't any stronger, a little more resistant to hail than others, but not that much. So these are just some products that are on the market. As I said, that double layer coating it expands and contracts with temperature. Uh, we want the airspace inflated about four inches. Any more than four inches really doesn't give us an added value. That if it's greater than a four inch inflation zone, uh, it's not gonna be as tight and it's gonna be more subject to wind. Uh, wind doesn't bother polyethylene until it starts to flap. <coughs> if you've ever tried to tarp something on the back <coughs> of a pickup or something like that, you know that the tarp is not gonna tear up unless it flaps. If it's less than four inches, uh, you're gonna probably have contraction problems, and if it comes into contact with the interior layer, you're gonna cause a condensation drip or lose some energy. For inflation, we use a uh, scroll cage fan. Um, it's called a scroll cage, because uh, imagine a chipmunk or a hamster or a s little mouse running in that scroll cage, and we put that in the greenhouse or to inflate the fan, inflate the film. So here's a couple examples of a greenhouse where we've got the inflation point on the inside, but the air is coming from the outside. Now I'm gonna tell you that you should use outside air to inflate your greenhouse and not inside air. Why might that be? Humidity. Humidity is the primary thing. What would be the argument for using inside air? What's that? It's warm. Okay. So we are going to take the. We have one option to use warm air, or we have option to use outside air for humidity. The outside air during the winter time is going to have higher humidity or lower humidity than the inside <coughs> air going to have lower humidity. So what happens when we use the outside air and bring that in to inflate our greenhouse, 
we don't get condensation. When we use inside air, and when we talk about cooling pads, we'll talk about how much moisture the air can hold based on its temperature. If we use inside air, it's got more moisture in it, and it's going to condense and cause lots of water. And by the end of this, the winter season, in a 100-foot greenhouse, you could have 30, 40 gallons of water on the inside of that greenhouse. Now, I'll tell you right up front that there are other greenhouse owners that tell, will tell you that that energy conservation is more important than the water, but not, not me. Yes? If you could collect that water, well, here's the thing. If it's coming from the inside of your greenhouse from evapotranspiration, you already paid for it. You've already paid. It's your water. Are you going to get enough water off of that to irrigate your plants? No, maybe one day. <laughs> By design, could you do that to collect the water, to collect that condensate to irrigate your plants? Well, there are some people out there that would probably say, I'm going to get as much water from everywhere as I can. Yeah. Okay. So this particular grower, and this is a greenhouse in uh, outside of Portland, and he is definitely inflating his greenhouse with uh, outside air. Polyethylene film houses without heat. Um, th this picture on the left is an example of a set of high tunnels. Um, this grower is growing chrysanthemums in the ground, and he's just using the polyethylene film to keep in a little bit of temperature, pulling it tight. This is a greenhouse on the right. This is a greenhouse operation in um, South Louisiana, uh, where they're not providing any heat in this greenhouse. This is actually a nursery, but um, you can use poly houses with minimal heat just to give you some winter protection. This, in South Louisiana, this, green, this greenhouse is just uh, trying to extend the season, using it as extens season extension, um, and to get, so he can have uh, faster si spring sales. Can that also be used here in Colorado as an extension? Uh, can this actually be used in Colorado as a season extension? Absolutely. Or you could take the same house, and you could cover this with white poly, white poly, and you could use that white poly as a, as a stabilizing force to keep your plants dormant so, or to protect them during, for winter protection, especially for nursery crops. White poly is, a, is common in the northern climates for winter protection, for uh, temperate plants, trees and shrubs, so for spring sales. Question. It's holding heat in. It's, a, it's an extension by keeping, giving, it's a little bit warmer climate. Okay. Will it amplify the sun at all or will that reduce it? It'll reduce the sun. Okay. But it, it, in, a, in an operation like this, it's probably more of a moderating force where it's keeping the temperature uh, warmer at night and probably not so hot during the day, so it's probably more uniform. <coughs> So these are just some interior shots of some poly houses. This one in the left hand, top left hand corner uh, is a ground to ground for bedding plants, uh, growing plants on the ground. Um, we have uh, a poly vent ducting to move air in the greenhouse. We, um, you can see that they've got a little extra truss frame up in the roof section to give it a little more stability. This is a greenhouse, um, a poly house 35 feet wide, and you can see it's got purlins. This greenhouse on the top has got one purlin, and this greenhouse has got uh, five purlins. One, two, it's got one above the, the vent, the, the poly ducting. And the north end of the greenhouse is uh, where the heating units are and the cooling system is with the vents, you can see. And we have a peninsular design for crop full of poinsettias. Now this greenhouse, you can see that we're using 
inside air. And that particular greenhouse we used inside air because getting the outside air was, was a challenge. So this is actually one of the greenhouses I used to work in in Mississippi. In um, so a lot of the offshore production, specifically in Colombia, uh, they use uh, poly houses primarily to shed the water and give a moderating temperature as well. These are um, rose and cut flower houses in uh, outside of Bogota, and you can see that they're <coughs> relatively cheap frames. Um, they're using a truss design that's got a sawtooth arrangement. Um, that blue strip on the back side is actually blue sticky material for western flower thrips. It's a trap. But this is a um, poly house in Colombia. Using energy, we can bring energy from the roof in our this is a, just some alternative ideas. This is a greenhouse where they've got ducting up in the uh, gable area of the greenhouse and they're drawing that hot air during the daylight, daytime, and then pumping that hot air under their benches. And this particular greenhouse is in Paonia, Colorado, and they're actually able to bring in enough hot air during the daytime and pump it under their greenhouses that they can grow. This is a crop of lettuce um, that they're doing quite well. This is a greenhouse where they're collecting the rainwater off the roof. Is this legal? Depends if you own the water rates. The, 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 the challenge is, do you own your own well? Do you own the water rights? This greenhouse is uh, in Colorado. And I'll tell you, it's an illegal installation. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's an illegal installation. But the state water engineer, I can tell you, is not going to prosecute this person unless somebody does what? Complains. And I can also tell you that 150 yards off this direction is the Colorado River, and I don't think anybody's going to complain <laughs> that he's capturing this little bit of water. But um, it, a lot of parts of the country uh, where it is legal, it's a, it's a good, solid practice to capture that water. It's clean. Question. Is there a standard number of fans per square foot? Or a standard number of fans per square foot. I'm glad you asked that question. Oh, because later in the semester, we're going to talk about how to determine how many fans per square feet you need to have in a greenhouse. Okay. I really do like this, this little rig to collect that energy out of the roof. In more humid climates, uh, the air outside is in the wintertime is always less humidity. Okay. So the the Quonset style, some other alternative designs we can have. Um, this is a <coughs> a Quonset style frame that's just got shade cloth. This is a polypropylene shade, the black shade fabric um, for a um, protection. Uh, this is a sawtooth greenhouse design uh, in uh, Florida where they have chosen to shade the greenhouse before the energy gets inside. Polyethylene houses. This is a greenhouse. This is actually from Gully Greenhouses where they have roll-up side vents where the polyethylene film can be rolled up and down to give us some um, some uh, ventilation. You can automate these roll up, rolling uh, sidewalls if you want. Um, this particular operation, they're mechanical. They're done by hand. This is a uh, roll up poly vent on a large, on a large sawtooth greenhouse where it comes up and down, can control itself. Would you think that a wide open wall like that would have 
More insect problems or less insect problems? Less. It has what? Less. less. Why do you think it has less? Why what is that? They can, they, can leave. they can leave, yeah. Why would they leave? What's your comment? Airflow? No. What else? If we're opening it up to our pests, we're opening it up to our predators. predators. So actually, these open greenhouses have a better ecological balance. There's more predators. So not only we're keeping, we're keeping letting the good bugs, the bad bugs in, we're letting the good bugs in as well. And actually, they seem, seem to have a better balance. Polyethylene frames are also very good for temporary greenhouses. This is a temporary greenhouse that's designed for a parking lot. Say if you want to, if you have a hardware store or something like that, you just want to erect a greenhouse for a couple months out of the year to protect your, ants, your tender plants that are coming in for retail sales. So they're also very good for uh, temporary structures. So polyethylene films, very common, very popular. Next one I want to talk about are uh, rigid plastics. And rigid plastics, are there are many different flavors, of course. The first one I want to talk about is what we call fiberglass reinforced plastic, or FRP. Most people <laughs> just use the word fiberglass. It's not as popular as it used to be. Back in the 50s, when we first started using fiberglass, it was the glass, it was the material to use. It's flexible. It can be bent over a quonset frame. It's much more resistant to glass, to breakage and hail. And the other thing is that it has the fibers that are woven into the fiberglass material diffuse the light. So the light is we have lower light transmission, but since the light is diffuse, we have more efficient use of the light. Some of the problems with fiberglass reinforced plastic is that the surface is easily abraded. Because what we have is layers of spun glass that are put in between, sandwiched in between two sheets of Tedlar, okay, or a plastic material. And as the wind drives over that surface with sand and grit and debris, over time it sandblasts it and pits the, and the fibers then stand up and do what we call a bloom. And those frayed fi fibers collect dirt and debris over time and reduce the light transmission. So Brand new fiberglass reinforced plastic has a light transmission value of about 88%, which is considerably lower than glass. <coughs> However, since it's so light, so easy to install, and it has the di light diffusion, it actually transmits more light because it takes less structure. There are fewer shadows. So it's more efficient in the use of light. So here are some fiberglass reinforced. You can see the corrugations. They use the corrugations to give it strength and to help shed the water. Um, very few attachments. You do attachment with a spacer. You don't want the corrugation touching the purlin. If the corrugation touches the purlin, it's going to create a drip point. So we use a spacer to space it away. Um, this is what fiberglass reinforced plastic looks like after it's gotten very old and pitted and abraded and over time. This happens to be a um, fiberglass greenhouse that's uh, over a retail center. That greenhouse owner, that retail center, has no desire to change that roof. Why would that be? He's using it for a cheap cover to protect his, his uh, customers. customers. And also, because it reduces the light transmission so much, it's actually cooler and more comfortable for his customers. Production value, not much. When you're using corrugation material, fiberglass reinforced plastic, one of the challenges is to make sure that we lap the sheets together 
so that the uh, top part faces the leeward side of, the wi of your prevailing wind. If the wind was coming from the left to right rather than right to left, it had a tendency to drive debris, <coughs> grit, and dirt, or even lift up that material and strip it apart. So we try to lap it. In high wind areas, we need to have at least two laps. Sometimes a grower will even do three. Low wind areas, they'll, they'll try to get away with one, with one lap of the corrugation. Um, but over time, it doesn't seem to last as well. The connectors that are used uh, for screwing uh, fiberglass reinforced plastic together are um, specially designed screws that have a rubber grommet that seals themselves. And they're also assembled with a torque wrench so they're not over tightened. Because if you over tighten any of these materials, it'll splinter microscopic cracks that you won't even see at the time. And anytime you have a crack in this kind of material, it is an introduction for water, dirt, and grit. And it shortens the life of your, of your fiberglass reinforced plastic. Um, the old days, we used to use a wooden, chan wooden um, framing material to attach the, the fiberglass. Uh, today, we use corrugated neoprene or a foam-like material. And here you can see this little half clip to get that away from the purlin. We don't want to attach these directly to the purlin. We want it to be able to drip the length of the greenhouse, length of the width. A standard fiberglass reinforced plastic, we're putting those trusses or bows about eight feet on center for most uh, greenhouses, um, eight to 10 feet on center. And the, we put in the number of purlins to accommodate our snow load. Fiberglass reinforced plastic is extremely flammable. It's going to change your fire rating. If you're working in a fiberglass reinforced plastic and a fan motor catches the, the roof on fire, get out as soon as you can because it's not going to last long. Fiberglass reinforced plastic is very flammable. Question? Are there any methods for reducing the abrasion from like, sand? Are there methods to reduce the abrasion from sand? Um, actually, what there are, there are compounds that you can spray on the material to replace the materials, but it's very expensive and hard to put on. Uh, there's nothing really. Um, they've been working on <coughs> different products over the years to try to make something that's more resistant to that abrasion, and they've not found anything better than polycarbonate. You just want to be careful where you orient your greenhouse if you're going to be using mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, most people are not using fiberglass reinforced plastic anymore. They're using polycarbonate. Polycarbonate is still, they, they, it's been around for about 25 years now, still considered fairly new. It's, uh, there are no fibers in the material. It's stronger. Uh, most products have a 10 to 15 year life. Polycarbonate is the same material they use to manufacture bulletproof glass. Okay, So when you go to that 7-Eleven in, in the bad part of uh, Denver or someplace, and they've got these big plastic panels, that's polycarbonate. Okay. Um, it's widely used for end walls, uh, gables, Quonset houses. Um, it's easy to use to put on an old glass greenhouse. Um, it's got high impact resistance. Um, hand, stands up to hail pretty well. And of course, you need to use a polycarbonate sheeting material that's been designed for a greenhouse so that it has the uh, UV inhibitors included in the manufacturer. We find polycarbonate manufactured in several different designs. We have the traditional single layer corrugated material. We have double wall material. It's basically honeycomb and triple wall material. Question? How about that UV uh, resistance that, that would reflect the UV spectrum? Of it's reflecting the UV spectrum, that's correct. Well, there's three kinds of UV light, and it's all A, B, and C. Um, 
UVC radiation and UVB radiation is the ultraviolet light that hits the, hits the Earth. UVC radiation is the closest to visible, and that's what's just responsible for fading films, paints, fabrics, etc. UVB is what gives you a sunburn or a suntan. And um, that's not so much of a big deal with this. And actually, most of these films uh, will shield that UVB radiation. UVA radiation is that radiation that's screened out by the ozone layer that we don't want to ever see on the face of the Earth because that is a DNA disruptor and will cause third degree burns and give you cancer, um, kill you, whatever. We use UVA radiation to sterilize water. Um, over in the University of Greenhouse, they have a UVA radiation chamber for sterilizing surfaces and stuff like that. It's, uh, but that's what it, when people talk about ultraviolet light, they say, well, don't we need ultraviolet light for plant growth? The answer is no. So what we're really focusing on, what we call PAR light, or photosynthetic active radiation. So these polycarbonates transmit about 79%. The, the, the double layers, if you were to perk, uh, most of our greenhouse free models that we're working on is double layer polycarbonate got a high insulation value. The old sections of PERC are all fiberglass reinforced plastic. Uh, a lot of growers are using the three, three wall, uh, triple wall polycarbonate for their end walls and side walls for the high insulation value. Polycarbonates are not considered to be flammable by most zoning code operators. It will burn as long as you're maintaining an open flame. When the open flame goes away, it stops burning. I've seen incidences of greenhouses that have had fiberglass reinforced plastic lapped over on, uh, and connected to polycarbonate. The boiler sets the FRP on fire. The FRP burns, hits the polycarbonate, and it's snuffed. So a lot of growers are going to polycarbonate, especially for retail centers for fire code. Uh, the corrugated fiberglass, uh, for corrugated polycarbonate is attached exactly the same as fiberglass reinforced plastic. Uses the same technology, the same materials and such as that. Ad identical. The double wall and triple wall material requires a, an extruded channel. Basically a sash bar. And they're manufactured with neoprene seals to clamp into place to hold the polycarbonate together. So with a double wall and the triple wall, you're going to have a higher investment in framing materials to hold the roof on, but it's more going to be more than offset by the temperature savings or fuel savings in the energy conservation value of the double wall. And you can see how they work very well. And again, there are all kinds of manufacturers. Everybody's got a different model. And you can see it still has a condensate channel to bring in the material. And this is just a graph, graphic showing all the different kinds of uh, attachments that you have. Here's one with white for that um, lower light more for, uh, we see the, the white polycarbonates used uh, in ex exterior retail areas just to provide a little bit of a, of a cross protection for early season bedding plants and uh, also for holding over materials. Okay. The next form of rigid plastic that's common in the industry is acrylic. Now acrylic um, plastics, acrylic rigid plastics, has the highest light transmission, even higher than glass. These are the highest light transmission. However, the old acrylic compounds are very flammable, as flammable as, F as fiberglass reinforced plastic, if not more so. So a lot of growers were avoiding them because they were flammable and more susceptible to cracking and breakage from hail than was uh, polycarbonate. 
A lot of growers, though, that need that extra light will choose the acrylic over the polycarbonate for that extra light, light transmission. They make triple wall and double wall acrylics just like they do with the polycarbonates. Uh, some of the modern acrylics now that are coming out in the last uh, three to five years have been, they're incorporating into the manufacture of that acrylic silicone rubber. And what that does is it increases the resistance to cracking and breaking from hail and it reduces the flammability of the product. So the modern acrylics uh, are being manufactured. They're more expensive. Um, we're not quite as high a light value as the original acrylics, but yet uh, they're taking into account the reduced flammability for fire codes and also more stability from hail damage. Hail insurance is probably one of the most expensive things we have to buy for a greenhouse. Polyvinyl chloride films, PVC films, um, in between um, the life of uh, polycarbonate and polyethylene, not really very good material. So on the left hand shot, I have a picture of a greenhouse where we have on the right hand side fiberglass reinforced plastic and on the left hand side we have um, polycarbonate. Why would this grower do that? One side polycarbonate, one side fiberglass reinforced plastic. Allow the eastern sun in the morning, shade it a little bit more protection. Eastern sun in the morning, western sun in the afternoon, shade and protection. Exactly. Can you think of another advantage to doing it this way? Only half the greenhouse will catch on fire. Yeah, well, it's still caught on fire. Mm -hmm. Would it be cheaper? Cheaper? Why would it be cheaper? Exactly. What happened was this is particular greenhouse. This this greenhouse operator was choosing to recover his greenhouse, and rather than spend all of his money at once, he spent half the money to recover one side. He wait, waited three years and to recover the rest of the greenhouse after he'd started to recover some of his cost. So he, bo so he chose to recover only the east side for the east, easternmost sun and wait a couple years to cover the other side. Frankly, I don't think that guy ever really covered. This is a different greenhouse, but it looks the same. But anyway. Quonset structures. This is our one of our lovely Quonsets at Perk. This has got double polycarbonate um, bent over. Now this is single layer polycarbonate bent over the roof. Um, works just well. Works real well. Our university greenhouses. Um, all of our new greenhouses are polycarbonate, single layer polycarbonate, and triple wall polycarbonate on the side walls. By having a retractable heat curtains, retractable shade curtains on the inside, that offers a heat blanket that makes it equal to or better than a double polycarbonate roof without shade curtains. So by using that retractable shade system, we have an adva added advantage. Here's a lovely picture of some old fiberglass. This is a picture of um, reflected light, where that reflected light, um, that late afternoon sun is actually wasted. It's not being used by the greenhouse. But the, we're not getting that light into the greenhouse. Okay. So the rest of this lecture, I'm going to talk about some of the components that we need to think about in our greenhouse. And a lot of people don't think about doorways. Do you think of doors as being pretty uh, <coughs> after the fact, after the thought. But I'd like you guys to think about doorways as you design and thinking about building a greenhouse. 
Here's an example of a doorway that's wide enough to probably drive a pickup truck through. Um, you'll see that it's a sliding door. Why would you use a sliding door rather than a hinge door? Hinge door takes up space. Here's an example of using an overhead door for moving carts and materials in between greenhouses, but they're using a smaller door for people. Why would we do that? We want to keep our environments more distinctly separate. Greenhouse column designs. This greenhouse column is actually attached to uh, the floor, but um, underneath that is a footing. I've worked with growers that have had to put caissons in the ground many feet deep. The greenhouse, it's in, uh, this is a greenhouse in uh, Florida where the greenhouse, the post is uh, attached to a caisson. Uh, this little, that's what I'm calling the concrete footing that it's sitting on. But also these uh, braces in between, this particular site is in a hurricane zone. And those braces are for wind. And notice that they've got hanging baskets in the roof in the gable part. If, those hanging, if the greenhouse starts to rock back and forth in the wind, those hanging baskets start to swing in the wind. You've all been on a swing set that's pulled up the footing, haven't you? All right. A column cap. This is the uh, part of a greenhouse that attaches to the post. Now this is very distinctly designed for a greenhouse. It's designed to hold the gutter on top, and the gutter on top has also got devices to clip on to attach the glazing material. But it's got this little triangle in the middle. Can you imagine what that triangle in the middle is for? Any guesses? And it provides no support. We're going to put a, a, an angle iron in that and run it the length of the gutter underneath the gutter for condensation. Exactly right. And uh, that is this particular greenhouse design. That's a uh, patented uh, product. The water sheets off the inside of the greenhouse, hits this, uh, this channel, and is moved to a gutter. Knee braces. Knee braces are designed are primarily for greenhouses that grow mandevilla. I mean, no, they <coughs> for wind areas. Um, they. Uh, give us uh, additional support for wind and snow load. So a greenhouse engineer can add that knee brace to give us an additional uh, support. And again, here's another wind brace in this particular greenhouse operation to um, for a wind, wind area where they have wind loading. Purlin caps. The purlin again r runs parallel to the ridge line, and this uh, purlin cap is designed to capture water and to run it to the sash bar. The sash bar's got another channel that runs it down to the edge of the greenhouse so you don't have drips in the greenhouse. Drips in the greenhouse cause foliar damage. Foliar damage reduces the quality of your crop. Reduction of the quality of your crop means less money in your pocket. Downspouts. This is an example of a lot of greenhouses will have multiple downspots. Downspouts, if it's a long greenhouse, to get the water and make sure we don't have ice dams in the greenhouse, because ice dams in the gutter are going to raise the weight and give you problems with uh, potentially collapsing the greenhouse. And also these downspouts capture that condensate runoff as well on the inside. Outside a greenhouse, the downspouts, we want to make sure that those downspouts run all the way to the ground. Because if we have uh, s uh, spitting water outside the greenhouse, um, it's going to, if it's freezing, it's going to sheet ice on the side of your greenhouse. And the other thing we worry about too, with uh, li liquid water 
freezing outside the greenhouse blowing around is if you have a, a vent that needs to open or close with, uh, and if it gets iced up, you can uh, break your vent devices. So that's one of the things we want to focus on is to get, get that water sheeted off. Roof vents. When electricity was cheap, we, f we took the roof vents out. But now that people are starting to look at how much it costs to run the fans these days, roof vents are now ba coming back in, where the roof vent is uh, operated on a drive shaft. Um, they're called rack and pinion. This is the same rack and pinion type design that's in your steering mechanism of your car. Um, the, um, the rack and the pinion open and close the vent. Um, the challenge is on these is to make sure that these stay perfectly aligned because if they get out of alignment, the <coughs> rack can be, will bend itself. Um, we set most of our vents to open and close as a percentage of opening because if it only needs a little bit of cooling, we just open it up a little bit or a lot. The other thing is you need to make sure that if you have vent openings on both sides of the greenhouse that you only want to open the side on the leeward direction of the wind. That's why it's important to have a weather station on your greenhouse climate control system so you know which direction the wind is coming so you can tell the computer which vent to open or which vent to close. Our university greenhouses, our roof vents only face east. We don't even have western vents because I've watched these vents get ripped off. Side vents, these are what we use to open up uh, open and close to exp get in uh, air movement into the greenhouse for cooling. A lot of greenhouses uh, have the greenhouse, the vent, uh, vent actuators on the outside because the inside of the greenhouse is the valuable space. Of course, if you've got your vents outside, you need to make sure that you use motors that are designed to be in the weather. And you also need to make sure that you put some kind of uh, protection so people don't back their cars into them or their carts. And you also notice that this particular operation has black landscape fabric under there because we don't want vegetation under the bench. And the wrong thing to do to take care of that vegetation under a greenhouse vent is to use a herbicide. And I don't care what herbicide you use you're going to get it in that greenhouse. I don't care if it's Tordon, 2,4-D, Roundup, or something organic. It's going to get in the greenhouse and give you problems. So it's critical to make sure you control the weeds under your greenhouse, under there. This particular grower over here, you can see their uh, framing. He's got gravel. Sidewalls. Here's a that side vent again. Manual vents. These are all Lord and Burnham vents. Pictures from Perk. In the old days, we would go through and open and close these in the morning and night. Um, these are actually getting to where they're hard to find. Drop wall vents, becoming more common. You can't see the little fine wires, the cables inside here, that when this wall comes back up, it's got little cables to keep it from flapping. Um, can you see the wires here? Barely? OK. And again, we talked about pest management in these greenhouses. It's actually more efficient. Screening our vents. This is an insect screen for the vent. Screening uh, reduces the amount of pesticides we need to apply by keeping some of the insects out. These, this is uh, very common in greenhouses where we're using stock blocks where we want to maintain them virus free. The insect that we're primarily trying to keep out with the screening is the western flower thrips that spreads the um, tomato spotted wilt virus or the impatience necrotic spot virus. So screening is a very efficient 
very effective way. But we need to make sure that we probably need to double or even triple the surface area of the screen compared to the vents so that we get adequate airflow. Retractable greenhouse uh, mechanisms, um, most of them are automated. This is a series of slides on some shafts where we've demonstrated um, the retractable shade system. And th this is a mylar film that bunches up in sections, uses a series of drive shafts. This series of photographs are examples of a retractable roof system. Here we can see the rack and pinion drive that's designed to move the mylar back and forth to open and close the structure. Retractable roof systems has lots of moving parts. This is a flat Cravo design. It's designed primarily for uh, retail areas or areas that doesn't have a lot of snow load. Very efficient, very easy to build, very effective. Here's the exterior view of uh, retractable roof gable section. You can see the um, opening to the top where it's starting to open to vent to cool the greenhouses. Most of the time they don't have to open them fully. This is fully opened. These greenhouses are designed with no uh, pad and fan cooling system. Here is the mylar with completely closed. Here you can see the cabling that holds the mylar in place that runs it back and forth. These have to be installed with laser devices to keep them straight. Inside view, you can see the reinforcing. The forward, the front section greenhouse is open. The section to the back is closed beneath the gutters. This greenhouse also has retractable shade underneath. Another shot. Oftentimes, uh, people will put in motors that have a hand crank in case the power goes out, as an example of this motor here. This is a MX design greenhouse or open roof designed by the Van Wigernen Company out of uh, North Carolina. You can see that they open completely up. Most of the time, these greenhouses don't open quite this wide because if a wind was to come up and it would damage the structure. In Florida and, and more hotter areas, oftentimes we put the shade on the outside of the greenhouse. The next series of photographs are a series of slides from some gardens botanical gardens that I've visited. This is the Como Conservatory. Como Conservatory is a beautiful greenhouse operation. It's part of the Como Zoo and Botanical Garden in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's well worth a visit, uh, even in the wintertime. It's been newly remodeled. Um, it's a fully glass operation. This is the Bellagio Hotel. The Bellagio Hotel has a nice conservatory. They also have a greenhouse on the back that's about three acres in size to support this operation. Most of you that have visited the Bellagio maybe didn't even know they had a greenhouse because you never got out of the casino. Oh, I'm sure some of you have seen the greenhouses. And of course, Denver Botanical Gardens. This structure is, the framework is made out of concrete. It's been here for a long time. This is the uh, Epcot Land Pavilion from the back side of the greenhouses that most people don't see. And of course, shots from Longwood Gardens. Longwood Gardens is in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, 60 or 70 miles to the west of Philadelphia. Longwood Gardens has an excellent uh, internship program and a master's degree uh, with the University of Delaware in Botanical Garden Administration. Everybody should visit Longwood Gardens. And the final shots that I have are from the Missouri Botanical Garden. 
the missouri botanical garden has placed their infrastructure on the exterior of the glass.